technology that was required actually to come to those optical cones. Uh, you can imagine, in principle, the optical cones are pretty straightforward expansion from femtosecond pulse generation, but nevertheless, you remember from the history yesterday, it took really essentially about 40 years of uh, breakthroughs to come to a point where we have actually have lasers that are uh, suitable for those cones, to make such cones. Let me quickly propose that to so today I would like to introduce a few concepts about optical frequency cones and of course talk about the few applications that emerged the last few years and then also mention maybe a few uh, future directions, uh, especially I also already mentioned to you that you can nowadays make cones that are so intense that you can actually ionize gases with them and since you can control the, electric, uh, the phase of the electromagnetic wave very precisely, we can do kind of interesting physics this way as well. So again, as like yesterday, I would like to start with a brief overview of history, not history of lasers now, but history of uh, precision measurements of optical frequencies. So for instance, I have a green laser pointer here, that's about 532 nanometers, as we know now since today. It's a Chi 2 medium inside frequency dialing a 1064 laser. The thing is, the frequency of this laser pointer is about 600 terahertz. And so now 600 terahertz, for an electrical engineer, this is just no more interesting because you can definitely not use electronics to measure 600 terahertz anymore. Um, but with optical frequency cones, you will be able to actually do that. And in a phase coherent way, the same way an electrical engineer would measure 10 gigahertz signals. Now, the relative uncertainty was not very good in the 1920s, especially the way they did it. Usually, you use a prism like the Pink Floyd prism I mentioned yesterday. You split white light into a rainbow, and then if you propagate long enough, you can then use uh, geometry to work out the frequency of this light you try to measure. The problem is if you want better resolution, you have to go longer and longer distances and you have to make a slit that's very, very narrow, so you let through only a very, very small fraction of your light because the slit width gives you kind of the resolution in your frequency measurement. And so for low coherent light sources, people were pretty quickly limited by actually the photon number. So once you make, say, 20 meter long uh, propagation between prism and your screen, and you have a slit that's only 100 micron wide, if you take a candle and you want to analyze whatever colors are in that light, well, there are probably 100 photons per second there, and you have to measure pretty long to actually get a good enough statistics. And so simply, measurements were typically limited to 10 to minus 7. One part 10 to minus 7, that would be at a 100 terahertz, uh, 10 to minus 7 times 10 to the 14, so it's about 10 megahertz resolution. Or in the visible, it would be a few 10 megahertz resolution. So not very satisfying when you are used to measuring things with hertz kind of levels. Then with the invention of the laser 50 years ago, the only thing that actually changed that time was you had significantly brighter light sources. So now people really went long distances. You can make a spectrometer as tens of meters long, 10 microns each width, and everything works out. And you get an improvement in your measurement simply because you have more photons in your light. So you remember in the previous talk, uh, the speaker talked about transverse mode profiles. So if you have a poor transverse probe mode, you get a very low intensity, but if you have a very good transverse mode, you can get really high intensity over long distances. And so that's where the lasers really helped. But this is still pretty boring. This curve just follows about Moore's law, and we live on Moore's law, we like Moore's law, but we want to do much better than Moore's law. And actually, in optical frequency measurements, we beat the Moore's law by a large fraction. You see, this is a logarithmic scale here, and only in the last about 15 years or so, optical frequency measurements improved by six orders of magnitude. There are a lot of fields in science which can improve six orders of magnitude in such a short time. So this is uh, about three PhD durations, actually, essentially, and you get a million-fold improvement in precision measurements. And the trick here was really to be phase coherent. I will explain that a little bit in more detail, but instead of measuring a frequency, we want actually to count each individual cycle of light to plus minus one, or nowadays even to much better than plus minus one cycle. 
And so this phase coherence, that's what really is the key to this enormous uh, development here. So here, as a little, for a little comparison, this dot down here corresponds to a gravitational blue shift of 10 centimeter altitude change. So I have a very accurate clock here, but if I move my clock 10 centimeter higher up, it will actually run 10 to the minus 17, uh, one part in 10 to the minus 17 uh, different because of the gravity. So it's a general relativity effect. Or in other terms, this is about the Doppler shift of light when I move with 10 micrometers per hour. So very, very small shift. So this is an enormous sensitivity. OK, how can we actually do that? So how can we come up with those red dots? What changed compared to the creating and increasing spectrometers? So first of all, why is that important? Why would I ever care to measure, uh, for instance, time so accurately? Because I will be late anyway in the morning. I oversleep. And so why do I need to know time to 10 minus 17? Well, first of all, it's pretty cool if you do what if you do something that's really cool, you are staying motivated, right? Then you do good work. So that's kind of the secret of successful professional life. Do cool stuff. And so this is pretty cool in my case. And so, of course, there are many other things. Precision tests of general relativity, I told you, if you move a clock only 10 centimeters up or down, you can already see the gravitational blue or redshift predicted by Einstein. And these are things that are hard to test since these effects are so small. Uh, precision test of quantum electrodynamics, especially the amp shift. You remember when you look at the atomic model uh, in quantum one, maybe you stop pretty much at a hydrogen atom with the coarse level structure. But the closer you look, the more effects are there. And one effect for the lamp shift is you have the core. The core has very strong fields around it. The electrons have very strong fields around them. And so they create virtual uh, particles around them and eventually that will lead to a shift of the level structure. And these shifts are not very really large, but if you can measure transitions in atoms very accurately, you can actually measure this effect and uh, you can really do quantum electrodynamic tests. And of course, atomic molecular optical physics uh, play along the same lines. And as I mentioned at the very beginning yesterday, one of the big questions in physics is, are physical constants really constant? And so all the predictions say the constants are constant to about at least one part in 10 minus 18 or 19 per year. But what if, what if we can measure 10 minus 20 and what if we measure a change? And that would be pretty cool because that simply means our model doesn't describe those constants adequately. Obviously what we do is we take them from out of nowhere, we make a measurement and we say this constant is the same in the whole universe. Well, we might actually be wrong. This constant might actually have a time evolution. And this time evolution would be pretty cool to test with such a precision clock. The way we would do that is simply we would make two different atomic clocks, for instance, using light. If you use different atoms, each atomic transition which you use for your clock transition can depend on different constants. For instance, fine structure constant, you know, from uh, quantum mechanics one or so, the fine structure constant might influence this level in certain ways, or then you have the ratio between proton and electron mass, and so that might affect maybe the other transition in some other ways, and so if you compare two different atoms, you might actually be able to see the change of the relative frequencies. So that's where comes probably really will really shine in the next 10 years or so. Also, of course, there are many, many practical applications, gas analysis, medical diagnostics. I might talk just a little bit about that as well. How can you make uh, diagnostics using femtosecond combs? Dim dimensional metrology if some combs these days as well. And of course, atomic clocks and maybe at some point actually nuclear clocks. If I have enough time, I will show you some proposal how to do that. Of course, for metrology people, there were also the SI units. I mean, we know SI units. I work in the US now, so we don't care about this as much, but in principle, we should. <laughs> so you have a bunch of units. They are actually all defined. But if you, might, if you want to make use of units, even if they are defined, which means they are precise, you still have to be able to actually apply them to something. And then other things that seem kind of interesting is, for instance, meter and second, I will show their definition on the next slide, 
they actually are kind of interlinked with each other. These definitions are not independent. And so an optical comb can actually combine these two into one definition if you want to. Another one which is interesting is actually the temperature that Kelvin will be referred to most likely the definition of a second using a femtosecond comb. So this is work in progress and it will take probably about 20 years to change this. It will probably take 5 to 10 years to change the definition of the second and of course then you have this complicated diagram where you can derive all the other stuff like acceleration velocity and so on based on this but that's not so important. Okay so here are the definitions for instance for the meter the meter is the length of the path traveled by the lens in vac uh, by light in vacuum during the time interval of one over a ridiculously large number of a second. Well you can see that's the speed of light which is a defined entity nowadays. The second is the duration of some other really big number of periods of radiation corresponding to the transition between two hyperfine levels of season. Okay, whatever that means. But what we are talking about here is really we take an atom, we look at energy level differences, and then of course the energy level you remember h bar omega is the energy between two levels, and so I can connect the energy difference into a frequency and this is exactly this 9 gigahertz times uh, 2 pi times h bar gives me kind of the hyperfine splitting in the season atoms and so we use the def we use already an atom but unfortunately in a microwave domain to define a second then we use the second to define what the meter is through the definition of the speed of light and so all these things kind of rely on optical measurement since we use the speed of light to measure the meter, we use time, which is actually another form of light, it's a microwave, but it's light as well. So probably in the next five to ten years this number will be replaced by a number of the order of a few hundred terahertz because measurements are much, much more precise than a few hundred terahertz. And so that's thanks to the development of optical frequency. Okay, so in dimensional metrology, for instance, if you don't want to measure frequency, you saw this sketch, I will use it today a little bit in a different way. I want to measure the length between these two mirrors, for instance, and you remember the boundary conditions imposed that the round trip time 2L is exactly an integer multiple of the wavelengths. And now the wavelength is, of course, nothing but the speed of light divided by the frequency of the light. So if I really want to use this definition of the SI units, I have to be able to measure the frequency of the light precisely. Uh, this way in vacuum, then I can know what the wavelength is. Uh, there is no easy way to directly measure the wavelengths, but there is now there is an easy way to measure the frequency of the light very accurately. So the problem when I try to do that is essentially I'm working at hundreds and hundreds of terahertz but the definition of the second is in a microwave domain. So 9 gigahertz, 10 gigahertz, this is where electronics really works well. This is where all these measurements really work well. But so to really make use of the SI unit definition, I have to be able to connect this 9 gigahertz up to these hundreds of terahertz through actually a phase table link. So phase stability I will explain just on a few slides, in a few slides. Another thing is if we want to redefine the second, we probably would go to very high frequencies. So let me explain this. If I have a watch here, I have a quartz in it. This quartz has a Q factor of probably about 10 to the 4. So that means the line width of this oscillator is about 10,000 times narrower than its center frequency. The center frequency is maybe 30 kilohertz or so. So I get 30 kilohertz divide by 10,000 or maybe 100,000 for the best courses available. And so this is kind of the uncertainty with which my clock will be wrong. So my clock will be somewhere in this range, but it can be actually off by 10,000. So if I would have the same lousy Q factor of 10 to, the, 10 to the 4, but my oscillator would run at a much, much higher frequency, maybe things don't change yet. But if I look at atomic transitions, here is a calcium atom, for instance, I get actually line waves of the order of a few hertz. But now this frequency itself is at hundreds of terahertz. So the Q factor of atom 
oftentimes corresponds to uh, 10 to the 15 cubes, something you can definitely not achieve with electronic oscillators. The best quartz oscillators are about 100,000 EQ, and then there are some more sophisticated sapphire oscillators, but it's very hard to get Q factors of the order of 10 to the 15. And so our hope is to actually replace the cesium, which has this very low frequency, by an atom that has a very, very high frequency, and in return even a higher Q. But nowadays it goes this way that we actually use the cesium and we want to measure the center frequency of this, so again we need kind of a phase stable link. Okay, so now what's the difference between phase measurements and frequency measurements? So imagine I have a pulley system here and a rubber belt going around. So this pulley is rotating at omega 1 frequency and this guy is rotating at omega 2 frequency. And of course it's a reduction gear, I can make a gear ratio of n, it can be an integer number or not, I don't care, but it's a constant. But if my pulleys are very smooth, I could actually have some slippage here. Slippage is not very bad usually because if I have a little bit slippage, say okay this goes at omega 1, then this goes at omega 2 plus minus maybe some very very small uncertainty. Now this small uncertainty starts to bug me because when I measure for a very long time, this uncertainty will not get smaller. If the pulley slips at a constant rate, maybe delta omega is small compared to delta uh, to omega 2, but I will always end up with this nasty offset frequency delta omega when this pulley slips a little bit. So instead of actually doing the frequency measurements, every measurement has some sort of an uncertainty unless you measure an integer number. When you do a frequency measurement, it would be much better to actually have something like this, a chain. A chain drive, I know if this rotates uh, 10 times, this will rotate n times 10 times, or n times 10 times. And so this ratio is fixed. I can still have some, maybe, play in my chain, the chain might vibrate or something, but what I know is that the maximum phase error I get is only such and such, so it's a finite number. So delta phi is a finite number just the same way as my delta omega over here was a finite number, so I haven't won yet, but actually when I write down the frequency of this pulley compared to this pulley, it's a little bit better because I know that accumulated phase error is simply the integral of the frequency difference over time. And so I know, due to my pulley system, this is a number that's smaller than an arbitrary constant, so it's not infinite, it's a finite number. Uh, then I can, of course, easily invert this, and I know that if I wait for a very long time, the frequency uncertainty goes to zero. And so that's really what the femtosecond cones live off. So we make a system like this to reduce the frequency of an optical wave. So we reduce hundreds of terahertz to something measurable. Something measurable means microwave or radio frequencies. So something I can measure with an electronic circuit. And so that means we need a pulley system that actually, or a chain system that actually reduces the frequency by about two million. It's a large number, so it's maybe hard to draw it, but anyway, I will show how easy it is. And so the nice thing is, in this case, no systematic error in frequency measurement. So if I wait long enough, my frequency error goes to zero. Whereas in this other system where I measure the frequency error, actually, directly the error doesn't go to zero. Okay, so now we need a gigantic reduction gear with a ratio of about one million, then we can achieve this. And so the trick here is really a Facebook group. So who, who has heard about Facebook groups before? Okay, so let's go through. Yeah, you, yeah, of course, that's cheating. <laughs> okay, so here is a kind of a general Facebook group. So think about, this is now all in the microwave. You can buy uh, parts at the Radio Shack, or I don't know how it's called here in Australia, but I'm sure they have some stores like this too. So here I have an oscillator. This is a radio frequency. Say radio frequency F0. And Usually they contain these divider stages, so if I have F0 here, then this divider simply makes F0 divide by M, so I can reduce my frequency. But even if you let them out, it still kind of works. 
Then here is a device called a phase detector. So all it does, the output of this, is the phase difference of this input signal and this input signal. So think of these two sinusoidal waves. If they are in phase, I get zero out. If they are pi out of phase, then I get one out. Or if they are minus pi out of phase, I get minus one out. And then I have some box feedback electronics, which control another <coughs> oscillator, which oftentimes is called voltage control oscillator. So if I apply a voltage here, the output frequency will change. And so now this box adjusts the output frequency of this thing to match the phase of that guy. So I really make phase synchronous system, the phase of this signal will be exactly the same of this signal. And by doing so, I generate a new frequency, which is now the ratio of these two dividers times the input frequency. So a phase lock loop locks the phase of this oscillator to this oscillator, maybe with some fractional ratio. But it's really this phase reduction here. Is that completely unclear now? Do you have some questions about this? Because this is kind of essential for the next few slides. Can you imagine kind of, I mean, I don't expect you to build this right now, but can you imagine how this works? No questions? OK. OK, so this is actually extremely popular. You all have some of these in your pocket now, because a cell phone contains these, a PC contains these. You have them really everywhere. And so what's in this feedback box? So it's actually kind of a genetic thing, and it's oftentimes called PID control. And PID stands simply for proportional integral and differential control. And so all this box really does, it takes a thing called error signal, that's the input of it. It creates an output signal to control your machine up here to generate a very desirable error signal. So in our case, we want zero here, so zero phase difference So this box makes a signal that I get zero at the input. So this is kind of what's inside of this PID box. Proportional is simply a proportional constant times the error signal. The integral part is simply the integral over time of the error signal. The differential part, well, you guess it, it's the derivative over time of the error signal. In the end, I sum up all of these, and I get my output. So it's really a simple system, and I think I don't have time to really go into details, but all we have to do is we have to find the right con game constants here, kp, ki, and kd. By doing that, I can always make a system to do exactly what I want to do. So for instance, cruise control in car, that's exactly what's in it. So if you push cruise control in your car on the steering wheel, it will engage such a lock. The error signal will be the difference between your current speed and the speed you set. You set it to uh, 60 miles an hour, you are driving 58, the error signal will be minus 2 and it will create some output to push down the axle just enough to follow uh, your desired speed. And of course, autopilots in aircraft do that with thermostats or clock generators in PCs and so on, or optical frequency comes and let's talk about this. Okay, so now we have this thing, but now we need a voltage controlled oscillator that produces hundreds of terrors. So it's obviously not going to be an electronic gadget. And so these are the first attempts actually of making such a voltage controlled oscillator and a phase lock loop that really goes from the definition of the second, the cesium clock, 90 hertz, all the way up to 500 terahertz, to so have a petahertz. And this was the very first uh, phase coherent measurement. The very first one, it was published January 1st, 1996, so it's 14 years ago. It's not very long ago. And I must say, this was a real pain in the neck experiment. So you start off with this uh, cesium clock, you lock a hydrogen laser, so here is your first PLL. Then you have a quartz oscillator, because unfortunately this box was not in the same room as the rest of the experiment, so they had a cable here. Cable introduces noise, you do another oscillator, and so on. And then here are always phase lock loops of really obscure uh, oscillator like a methanol laser working at 4 terahertz and so on. So really hard to work with. And uh, I think 
some PhD students probably went crazy by trying to lock all these things up at the same time and then measure this one optical frequency. And now if you go and you want to measure another frequency just a few terahertz away, this whole thing might no longer work because you will not be able to reach the right frequency and you have to reveal everything. So it did work. It gave a reduction ratio of about 1 to 4 million, but I must say it's a real pain in the neck. And so I want definitely an easier method. So now, another way people did, actually you might know Ted Hensch got a Nobel Prize in 2005, and so he already worked on such things uh, in the 70s. This paper was actually published in 78, so here is your mode of picosecond laser now. In the 70s they didn't really have the femtosecond technology we have nowadays, but the system is pretty much the same. You have these laser mirrors as we had them yesterday, it has a short pulse in it, whenever it hits the output coupler, you get a copy of it out, and so you get a periodic pulse drain. The periodicity is, of course, exactly the round trip time inside of your oscillator. And so when you take this and you fully transform now this envelope, well, it's a periodic function. Fully transform of a periodic function will have a periodic periodicity in the frequency domain as well. And so here is our intensity of the spectrum of this light as a function of frequency. And the periodicity, of course, no big surprise, is 1 divided by the periodicity in the time domain. Works just the same way in space. For instance, in quantum mechanics, you did similar things in the uh, spatial domain. Making wave packets, for instance. OK, now the hand <laughs> find out early on that, OK, we have this nice cone-like structure now in the frequency domain. These frequencies are all hundreds of terahertz. <coughs> So he took an uh, atom, sodium, that has not me been measured before, and he noticed that there are a couple of transitions inside of it, which can be accessed by actually some frequencies. So if I have two photon absorption, one photon from here, one photon from here, I can bring an electron from this state to this state. I take one photon from here and one from here. I can excite one from here up to here, and so on. And so by now sweeping this kind of spectral structure over my atoms, I can see fluorescence from the atom or no fluorescence from the atoms. If I'm detuned to those lines, the atoms don't absorb. I mean, air is transparent, even though air has strong absorption in certain frequencies, but it's transparent because most of the light will not be resonant to any of those transitions. And so the cross-section is pretty small. Another benefit of having two photons is actually you can shine light against each other and you get rid of Doppler shift. So even if your molecules are moving around, you can cancel that out. And so that's what he saw. He saw kind of a structure uh, in the absorption spectrum as he swept the comb over these atoms. Actually, sweeping was pretty easy. All he had to do is he had to make the resonator a little bit longer because by pulling the resonator apart, the pulses will go a little bit further apart. The effect is that my comb spreads out a little bit, and of course, since it's kind of pinned down at zero, all these comb lines will sweep over those resonant lines. And once in a while, it will be resonant to one of those. Okay, the problem was actually, it was only possible to compare different optical frequencies among each other. All these frequencies were actually pretty close to each other. And so it was not possible to really measure the absolute frequency of these transitions. So we still need to work a little harder. And so actually at this, about the same time there, were, uh, there was work going on uh, doing something called optical content where it's actually commercially available nowadays by Mr. Crowley. Uh, so the idea was I had a CW laser, a CW source. I send it through an electro-optic modulator. All that thing does is it modulates the phase of the light and you put sidebands on it, so I have now my 100 terahertz here, and then plus minus a radio frequency. Then he noticed that if you put a cavity, an optical resonator around it, so that this cavity length is exactly matched to the spacing of those modes, you can get a cascading process, and I make also something that looks like an optical frequency con, but again, it's exactly the same problem as before. I have to know the frequency of this line, just the way that Hensch didn't know the frequency of his line, he couldn't really measure the absolute frequency. And so this thing is still very useful if you want to measure 
the distance from here to here, but it doesn't help you if you want to measure the absolute frequency of a line. And so that's where the optical comb really came in. And so now let's look at this picture one last time. And I showed it last uh, week, uh, yesterday. So I have my femtosecond laser. Now let's look at the electric field as well. My electric field evolves inside of the cavity with each round trip. It will maybe have some shift between envelope, red one, and the electric field itself, the black one, because I have a little bit dispersion left in my cavity. But nevertheless, we know exactly that this evolves in a continuous fashion after each round trip. I will have a certain amount of dispersion I went through. And so I know exactly what happens. But interesting is now that if we look at the output coupled field, each of these pulses are a copy of that original pulse plus this extra phase shift due to the dispersion. So look at this here. The black line lines up with the peak, so the electric field is exactly centered underneath my envelope. Then after one round trip, so this was a pulse that was emitted one round trip before this one. There is a slight shift, another shift, another shift, and so on. And after a few round trips, maybe the field reproduces uh, the original shape precisely or not. It doesn't really matter, but there is some evolution, some time after which this pulse is uh, the electric field actually evolved exactly by 2 pi. And so still I have TR, the round trip time, in my oscillator. So now let's take the Fourier transform not of the red line, but of the black line, which is actually the electromagnetic field, the electromagnetic wave. And now I get, of course, again, a periodic structure because of the periodicity here. But we have a double periodic structure, the periodicity from the field evolution rate. And so there is this thing called Fourier shift theory, and you can prove it on two or three lines on a piece of paper. If I have a, a pe double periodic uh, function like this one, I get my peri periodic structure in the frequency domain plus an offset. And this offset is simply the longer time scale here, one over the longer time scale is this offset frequency. So now if I say this is the mode number M, so this is mode number 0, 1, 2, 3, root mode M, then this optical frequency is M times the spacing of each of these lines plus this offset frequency. And so this is now the nice thing about these cones because I can measure or express hundreds of terahertz through two small frequencies, hundreds of megahertz or maybe gigahertz, plus the integer number. Integer numbers I like because I can measure them precisely. So I can easily measure, for instance, the pulse repetition rate. All I have to do is I put a photodetector here. The photodetector sees the square of the electromagnetic wave. So it sees exactly 1 over TR. The problem with that is it sees only the square. When I square something like this, take an electron wave function, for instance, psi square, you lose the phase information. Same happens here. I take the electric field to the square, I lose its phase information. But this offset frequency was actually due to this phase, due to the phase of the electric field. So photodetector will not see this phase. And so this was really hard to measure, and it took a long time to actually really measure this thing. And so the, the actual measurement of this kind of was then the beginning of this rush to better and better precision in optical metrology. So the way it actually worked was I take a line from here, has the frequency m times fr plus f offset. Then I frequency double it. You remember we had this lecture on chi 2 processes. This is a chi 2 crystal. So what it does, it doubles this frequency. So it puts a 2 here and a 2 here. So I end up with this one. But now this next line here, f phi was not doubled, but I have 2m over here. So if I interfere these two with each other, I get exactly this offset frequency. The problem to get that is actually that I need an octave of spectrum, and that was the hard part to get. You remember from yesterday. So now I get my comb, I know exactly what each frequency is, and uh, I can use that easily to measure uh, an unknown laser, let me show you how. So here I have a laser uh, emitting some hundreds of terahertz wave. I simply interfere it with my femtosecond comb. All I need is a beam splitter. I combine the two beams. And then what I get is actually another heterodyne beat node between my comb line 
and my uh, unknown CW laser, and this bit node again is in the radio frequency domain, and so the optical frequency of this laser can then easily be determined by measuring three radio frequencies and the integer number. And so this made it really possible now to phase coherently transfer optical frequencies down into the radio frequency domain. There is no slippage in this here because I have one integer number, this number will always be the same, it never slips. And all I have to do is I have to measure the phase of all of these signals, and I'm done. Questions so far? The food starts to sink in. <laughs> Soon coffee time. And so the problem was really to get this octave of spectrum to do that trick of the frequency doubling of the long part and the short part. And so here, this was uh, obtained no earlier than about 2001, but actually in 99, there was this very nice approach. I've seen this just in the morning today, photonic crystal fibers. They actually allow you not only to make very large core fibers for high power fiber lasers, but they also allow you to make the opposite. You can confine light into a very small core. The core here is only a few microns, actually about 1.2 microns in, in diameter. And so by confining light so tightly, you get, of course, very high intensities. Do you remember such a femtosecond laser emits immediately megawatts of peak power? You focus it into an area of only one micron uh, diameter. Uh, you get really high intensities. And when you go through a chi-3 medium, it will create more and more bandwidth. And so it was kind of a shock to see this paper in 99 because this really kind of voided the race of going to the octave from the oscillator. So they launched a 100 femtosecond pulse, which in our sense was pretty much not even a pulse that was so long that we didn't even care about. And the power was also very small, it's 800 picowatts, that's very weak. And by launching this weak pulse into a couple of meters of this fiber, they obtained the optical spectrum much wider than an octave. So this is what they needed. This is what they launched. And you see it covers the whole visible range. Actually, white light comes out here, plus all sorts of infrared light as well. That experiment didn't work then because actually this fiber has a lot of noise in it. But nowadays, this is a very standard way to do this uh, octave. But the fibers have to be much shorter than what they use. But this was really an amazing achievement. And so the first stabilization just then came one year afterwards. There were, of course, since this is still in the Cold War area of the uh, octave spanning generation and femtosecond generation, uh, it was very, very hard to get those fibers. Okay, so here is now how we can actually measure this offset frequency. We take our femtosecond laser, we launch it through uh, crystal fiber. If we don't have an octave, if we do have an octave, we can omit this step. Then we have an interferometer, but this is called a nonlinear interferometer because in one arm I have a second harmonic generation, so again a chi 2. So red comes in, blue comes out. Here on this one is a dichroic mirror, that means simply one color goes through, the other one gets reflected. So you have that in halogen lamps, for instance, that the infrared radiation comes out on the back and only visible comes out of the front. Then I can adjust the timing between these two arms because I want my red and blue pulse overlap. And then all I need is a photodetector and out comes my offset frequency. This was one of the early uh, co-measurements. I think this was a measurement we did in 2001. And so you see the repetition rate of the laser. Of course, the comb is still there. And then you see the offset frequency here as a heterodyne meter, a little bit between somewhere between the repetition rate and zero. And then, of course, you see also a mixing product. Since this takes, again, the field to the square, you see a mixing product again. So repetition rate minus offset frequency. And all we have to do now is we take this uh, signal from the photodetector, put a radio frequency filter around it, phase lock loop to a reference oscillator, control the laser to stabilize this, take the repetition rate, the second phase lock loop, control the laser, and there you go. We have a femtosecond comb. It's a piece of cake. <laughs> So it's really a piece of electronics that costs you probably 50 bucks. It's a laser that probably costs you 500,000 bucks, no, not quite anymore. It costs probably 50,000 dollars or so. But you get a comb that allows you to do frequency measurements 
with precisions that allow you to see Doppler shifts actually of the order of typically micrometer per hour. So very, very small. That's about the atom diameter per second or so. So actually, how are we? The time still a few minutes. Maybe we start that, late. That's not five. Ah. So the question, of course, is how can we now control the laser? I told you we need this uh, uh, voltage-controlled oscillator. What we do is, for instance, to change the FR, that's really easy. All I have to do is changing the length of my laser cavity. If I put it apart, FR will go lower because the pulse repetition that is slower. I can insert some material that changes the dispersion, which will affect only the offset frequency. But actually, I can also change the pump power. Oops. So I can change the pump power because it changes chi 3 in the crystal which we use already for for lens mode locking as I explained yesterday. And so I have some knobs which I can actually put an electric actuator to it, so like a piezoelectric actuator to change the cavity length or I change the pump power simply by controlling the diodes. Questions about the comps? I think that would be a natural way is to make a break. Okay, any questions? Comments?